Hi, I'm Scott Margolin and I'm the Vice President of Technical here at Tyndale. We're here today to talk to you about why arc rated and flame resistant clothing is so important, is necessary. And so for a few minutes, we're gonna step away from all of the other stuff, the standards and the logic and the rest of that, and look at the medicine and the science of this. The hazards that we're looking to protect against, arc flash, flash fire, combustible dust deflagration, and so on, they have a few things in common. They are all very brief, and they're very directional. So an arc flash is a fraction of a second, a flash fire is two or three seconds maximum. What that means is that they're very brief and they're very directional, that the vast majority of catastrophic injury and fatality in these events is not caused by the arc flash or the flash fire. It's almost always caused by that arc or fire igniting flammable clothing. So the key point here is don't wear fuel. If you're wearing flammable clothing, you're wearing fuel. So the life and death difference is to stop wearing fuel and start wearing clothing that won't ignite and continue to burn like what I'm wearing right now. That's number one. And there's a second thing that you want your arc rated and flame resistant clothing to do, and that is to insulate you to the hazard that you have. So not wearing fuel is the life and death difference. Insulating you to the hazard that you have so that you're not burned at all through the clothing is the second piece of the equation. The first piece is about survivability. The second piece is about protection. They're not the same thing. Heaven forbid you've ever been in a situation where you're at a burn center or a hospital, you're waiting for the surgeon to come through the double doors. The first question in everyone's mind is always, is he going to make it? Is she going to live? There are two things in that moment that are absolutely paramount. The age of the victim. The older you are, the less likely you are to survive the same level of injury. And the TBSA, or total body surface area, that receives either second or third degree burn. Now, if you know burns, you're thinking, what's he talking about? They're very different. So let's take a look at that. First degree burn is sunburn. We've all had that. It's not consequential medically. It's not predictive of life or death, so we're not really looking at it. But second degree and third degree are. So second degree burn, again, is blisters. Now that hurts and it does heal, typically without medical intervention and typically without scarring. Third degree burn, however, is full thickness. The skin is dead at that location. It will not grow back. And now you need grafting, which if you're not familiar with it, you take skin from where you have good skin, you put it where you need it. Now you have two holes in you. You hope the graft takes. And grafted skin is never the same. So third degree burns are much worse from the perspective of the quality of life that you get back to for the rest of your life than second degree. So if second and third degree burn are clearly very different, how can they possibly be the same for predicting fatality? What makes them the same for predicting fatality? That simple answer drives the existence of every fiber, every fabric, every garment, every standard, and every test on planet Earth around these issues. Second and third degree burn both break the skin, right? Once you break the skin, you have an infection path. Where do they take you when you get hurt? The hospital or the burn center where there are more infectious agents than anywhere on Earth. So the greater percentage of your skin surface is broken open, and both second and third degree do that, the more pathway you have for infection and the longer you're in the hospital around the infectious agents. With all that logic behind you, it's relatively simple to understand now why TBSA, or total body surface area, is so important. Once more than about 50% of your skin is burned, then you have more holes in your skin and you have skin left, right? So survivability plummets above about 50% body burn. Absolutely plummets. You, you do not want any second and third degree body burn, of course, but once it's above 50, things get catastrophic rapidly. I didn't talk about age. Let's come back to age. The older you are, the less likely you are to survive. Why? Because as we age, we heal more slowly. Well, if you heal more slowly, what's that do to the variable about how long you're in the hospital around the bugs? So with that quick snapshot of body burn and survivability, let, let's come real world and let's look practical for a moment. So any, any body burn percentage above 50% is catastrophic or fatal, right? The average adult American's skin surface from the waist up, believe it or not, is 60% more if you like your beer. So think about the implications for a moment. If you're working with no clothes on, and I'm not advocating that, but what's your maximum body burn in a directional brief event like an arc or a flash fire? If you have no clothing on at all, it's less than 50%, right? Because it's going to hit your front and not your back. And of course, you're standing on something, so the soles of your feet are okay. But So by definition, to have more than 50% body burn, fatality, you almost have to have clothing ignition, right? So that's one enormously important point. Take a look at the second piece. The average adult American skin surface waist up is 60%. So even if only your shirt ignited, if by some miracle your pants didn't, or only the top half of a coverall ignited, that is more than 50% body burn. Where does that fire go, by the way? We all know heat rises, right? You breathe through three very small holes right here. You don't 
want to breathe fire. You probably didn't need me to tell you that breathing fire is a bad idea. So in addition to the body burn implications for your skin, you run the risk of your esophagus swelling shut and dying of asphyxiation on the spot or doing such massive damage to your lungs that you aren't able to oxygenate your blood even before the infections in the skin become an issue. What's required to have that happen? How likely are you to breathe in enough fire and superheated gas in a tenth of a second in an arm flash or in a one or two second flash fire? It's almost unheard of. But if your garments ignite and they continue to burn for 20 or 30 seconds, you're going to breathe fire. So all these complex standards and tests and issues, they really come down to the simple fact. Don't wear fuel. As soon as you remove the fuel, your clothing doesn't ignite. You remove the vast majority of fatality potential. And then the next piece is to make sure that what you're wearing is insulated to the hazard that you have. So in a nine calorie shirt, I'm good at an arc of less than nine calories. Above that, the shirt still won't burn, but I may be burned through it because I've overwhelmed its ability to adequately insulate. So that's the arc flash piece. What about flash fire? It's an, there's an interesting difference in the standards, the 2112 standard versus the 1506 and 1959 arc rating standards. An arc rating means that you won't get any second degree burn below that arc rating. In flash fire, it's a little bit different. What 2112 says is that you can have up to 50% body burn and still pass the test. So something that's UL or other certification that it passes 2112 simply means that in a three second engulfment fire, you will have less than 50% second and third degree body burn through the coverall. I think we can all agree that you don't want 49% body burn. So it's important to ask, passes with what? The joke I like to make, I have three kids and you know, how'd you do on your calculus final? I passed. Are you okay with that? No, you're gonna say passed with what? Because you can pass with a 99 A plus or you can pass with a 61 D minus. So I would urge you to ask the same questions about your 2112 compliant flame resistant apparel. Passes with what? Because you can pass with 49% body burn or 40 or 30 or 20 or 10. And that's an enormous difference. So the data is collected, but typically all you'll see is passes or doesn't pass. It can be vitally important to ask your supplier passes with what? So the standards are a terrific starting point, but many companies these days who are well informed have looked at the dichotomy in the standards and said, you know what? Don't show me anything that doesn't comply with these standards, but I want to go beyond the standard. I care about my people and I want to make sure that they're in the best clothing, not just clothing that passes. So some people will say, show me stuff that's only 35% burn or less or 25% burn or less or whatever number they choose. And that's a very good thing. Well-informed employers who understand these issues and who care about their workers are making a conscious choice to ensure that the garments that are available in their program are not just compliant, they're the best, safest, most comfortable, most modern garments on the market. And I think that's a great thing for safety and comfort for all of us.